Jesus was the ultimate innocent accused, perfectly innocent in every respect, but condemned to die in shame and agony. But like the psalmist, he entrusted himself to God. stand let's pray heavenly father please speak to us now by your word and change us by your spirit to give you glory amen, amen. please do take a seat some of you uh, might be familiar with the story of reuben the hurricane carter you might remember denzel washington played him in the movie of his life called the hurricane uh, if you're not familiar carter was a better than decent middleweight boxer from patterson new jersey and in 1966, he was arrested on suspicion of murder because he was a black man in a white car, which was the only description the police had following a triple shooting. And with not much more evidence than that, Carter was convicted of murder and sentenced to three life sentences in prison. He maintained that he was innocent. In 1975, 10 years later, Bob Dylan released a song about him called The Hurricane. He called him the man the authorities came to blame for something that he never done, put in a prison cell, but one time he could have been the champion of the world. Towards the end of a fairly long song, he asked, how can the life of such a man be in the palm of some fool's hand? To see him obviously framed couldn't help but make me feel ashamed to live in a land where justice is a game. Finally, in 1985, nearly 20 years after he was imprisoned, Carter's conviction was overturned. The judge who overturned his conviction ruled that he hadn't received a fair trial because, I quote, the prosecution was based on racism rather than reason and concealment rather than disclosure. Shocking, isn't it? An innocent man spent nearly 20 years in prison because of racism and concealment from the police and the prosecution. From the outside, it makes us angry how much worse to be in the shoes of the man who'd been falsely accused? What could he do? The people accusing him, the police, had all the power. How could he defend himself? When there's prejudice and manipulation and threats and an imbalance of power, how can you hope to see justice? 
And when injustice reigns, who can set things to rights? Those were the questions that plagued Reuben Carter for 20 years as he fought to free himself from his prison cell. And those are the questions that stand behind Psalm 7, the psalm of the innocent accused, the psalm that is our passage for this evening. If you haven't already got it open, uh, please open up now. It's page 545 in those Bibles in the pews. Now, we don't actually know the context for this psalm. We can see from what it says that it was written in response to a false accusation that might cost the psalmist his life. But beyond that, we don't really know. The heading that it gives us is a little bit opaque. We have no idea who Cush of Benjamin is or what incident this psalm might be referring to. And in fact, we've no way of knowing because the details are lost to us. But I suspect that that's actually God's design uh, to remind us that this song isn't just for the psalmist in his specific instance of injustice, but it's for all of us when we face injustice of any kind, as we most surely will at one time or another. So, if the psalm is for us, what does Psalm 7 teach us? Well, no more and no less than what we already know from Psalm 1, which finishes with these words, Psalm 1, verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This psalm, Psalm 7, puts flesh on that promise in the context of unjust suffering. It shows us a model for how to respond to injustice by putting our faith in God, who watches over the righteous. So tonight, let's have a look at the psalmist's response to injustice. Now, we could break this psalm down into any number of individual sections, but we'd be here all night, so let's just look at it in three big chunks. Uh, the first section takes in verse 1 to 5, and we'll call it the innocent accused. The second section is verses 6 to 13, and concerns the judging God. And the third section is verses 14 to 17, and concerns the malicious accuser. So did you get that? Three sections. One, the innocent accused. Two, the judging God. And three, the malicious accuser. So if you haven't already, grab a Bible, turn up page 45, and we'll get stuck into section one. Have a look with me at the innocent accused. O Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me. Or they will tear me like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. O Lord my God, if I have done this and there is guilt in my hands... If I have done evil to him who is at peace with me, or without cause have robbed my foe, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. You can see there, this is a prayer for God to save and deliver him. And from the sounds of it, he needs saving, doesn't he? He's being chased by powerful, by ruthless men, and no one is going to help him. He says these chases are like lions threatening to rip him apart. Think with me about that imagery for a moment. Lions, as you know, are predators. They hunt in packs and they have an instinct for separating their prey from help, for isolating them so that they have no defence. As a shepherd, David rescued his sheep from both lions and bears, so he knows what he's talking about. And like a pack of lions, his enemies have isolated him. They've cut him off from all help. And now, as he sees it, they're closing in for the kill. They're preparing to tear him to shreds. And the imagery of these lions is particularly appropriate because he's innocent. Like an innocent lamb, he's done no wrong. So verses 3 to 5 look like the sort of oath that might go with a covenant ceremony. It's a bit like the playground oath that says, cross my heart and hope to die. Uh, perhaps you might have added, stick a needle in my eye. Maybe even with a cherry on top? Or is that, or maybe that was just my school. <laughs> well, anyway, what you were doing, even if you didn't realise it at the time, was saying that I commit to what I'm saying so strongly that if I'm lying, you have permission to kill me and stick a needle in my eye, perhaps with a cherry on top, if you said that bit. Now, obviously, in the playground situation, you didn't really mean that, did you? But the psalmist really means it. He stands accused for a crime of which he will be killed. Verse 4 suggests that he may have been accused of doing evil to someone he was in a covenant relationship with uh, and of robbing his enemies. So before God, he takes this oath, if I'm guilty as charged, let me die. Let them do to me as they wish. 
course, he can only say that because he's not guilty. He says, bring it on, give me exactly what I deserve, because you, my God, know that I'm not guilty, that I don't deserve what they're trying to dish out. So he's an innocent victim. This is the song of the innocent accused. And because he is innocent, he calls on God to defend him. So the second section focuses on God, the judging God. So look with me at section 2 from verse 6. He says, Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God. Decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather round you. Rule over them from on high. Let the Lord judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity, O Most High. O righteous God, who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. Can you see there, he's imagining a courtroom scene, a court where God sits as judge. But this isn't like any courtroom that we might recognise. Because this judge judges through military might, casting down the guilty. So these verses are full of military imagery. Arise, rise up, awake. These sound like battle cries, calling on the Lord to march out against his enemies. The psalmist is calling on God to match the enemy's rage with God's own anger, to match their violent threats with violence of God's own. And before we judge him for wanting his enemies to suffer, look at the verses that follow. What he wants is simply justice. Because for him there is no justice. He suffers from the opposite of justice, from injustice. His accusers mean to do him harm. They've subverted justice, they've twisted it around, they've made a mockery of it. They've used their power to hurt him. They are trying to destroy him. And all he asks for is that he'll get justice. That he would get his just deserts and that his accusers would get theirs. And you know, that's exactly what God's law says should be the case in the instance of a false or a malicious witness. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, we read these words. The judges must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. See, in the psalmist situation, earthly judges have utterly failed to put this into practice. So he calls on God to act as the judge and to do what's right. So the aim of this prayer, then, is justice. And for justice to occur, God must bring to an end the violence of the wicked. God must make the righteous secure. And so as the psalmist imagines this courtroom scene, as he thinks about God's justice, he stops to reflect some more on the character of this judging God. Have a look with me from verse 10. He says there, my shield is God most high, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword, he will bend and string his bow, he has prepared his deadly weapons, he makes ready his flaming arrows. Again, there's plenty of vivid militaristic imagery here, isn't there? God is his shield, his protection, and God is armed and dangerous. He has his sword poised to strike. His bow is drawn. The flaming arrows are already set alight. We might say his finger is on the trigger. Wouldn't you agree this is a stunning picture of God? This is the God of Psalm 2, the God whose wrath can flare up in a moment, the God who scoffs at human rebels and rebukes them in his anger. And this is the God of the New Testament whose judgment will come like a thief in the night. And for the wicked, this is a fearful image. For all that they seem to be able to do whatever they like, God isn't ignorant. God's like a sniper on a hill, lining them up and simply waiting for the right moment to strike. And the wicked will never know when he might pull the trigger. But for the righteous, this is the picture of the cavalry ready to come over the hill to ride to the rescue. We may think that God has forgotten us. We may think that he doesn't see our need or that he's helpless to help us. 
But the psalmist knows that God is right there with him, that he's watching, that he's powerful to execute judgment, and that his judgment comes suddenly, catching the wicked unawares and turning the situation upside down. Clayton TV produces the Sunday service and other Christian programs. To watch up-to-the-minute teaching, current issues, music and more, visit us online. You can find us and get more info at www.clayton.tv. So this reflection on the character of the judging God leads the psalmist to see the fate of his enemies. And it takes us on to the third section of this psalm where we meet section 3, the malicious accuser. Look with me down at verse 14. He who is pregnant with evil and conceives trouble gives birth to disillusionment. He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. His violence comes down on his own head. See, now he can see his enemies for what they really are. They're troublemakers, yes, but they aren't making trouble for him They're making trouble for themselves. And again, his vivid imagination sees their attacks on him as the source of their own undoing. Their evil is like a pregnancy, but the offspring it brings forth is disillusionment and trouble. And the trouble is reserved for the one who started it. In God's poetic justice, what goes around comes around. What they intended to harm others actually harms them. It's a bit like a wily coyote in a Roadrunner cartoon. Do you know the Roadrunner cartoons? You know, every cartoon begins with him unpacking his latest box of tricks from the Acme Corporation, and he sets out to catch the innocent Roadrunner. But every single time it backfires, and he ends up being the one blown up or tipped off the cliff or whatever it is. See, there's the same sort of irony at work here. Psalmist's enemies mean to do him harm, but they only hurt themselves. The evil they intended for others comes back on their own heads. But I guess the difference between Wile E. Coyote and the wicked is that they fail not because, like the Coyote, they're they're incompetent, not because their plans are flawed, and it's not because the righteous are too quick or too clever. No, evil recoils on its creators because God thwarts their plans. God is active, deliberately undermining all their attempts to harm his people deliberately turning all their evil intentions back against themselves. It's just like Psalm 1 taught us. That verse I read at the beginning, Psalm 1, verse 6, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So this psalm of the innocent accused ends in praise to the God who maintains justice, the God who upholds the innocent accused and returns trouble to the malicious accuser, the God who looks after his people. So how do we respond to this psalm? Is this just some sort of rhetoric, just a device to help us to feel better when we're in trouble? No, it's not. In fact, the Bible is full of examples of God doing exactly what this psalm expects him to. Think of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel's rivals in the royal court, well, they circled him like those proverbial lions. And they used real lions too. They manufactured charges against Daniel to get rid of him. They wanted to get him out of their way. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked will perish. So Daniel spent a night in the lion's den, but in the morning he was alive and well. He said to the king in Daniel 6.22, My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, for I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. Daniel was an innocent accused, and God preserved his life. His enemies were malicious accusers, and God turned their malicious intent against them. Daniel was lifted out of the pit, and his accusers were thrown in. They suffered the fate that they had intended for him. In the words of this psalm, they fell into the pit they had made. Or think of the book of Esther. Esther and her cousin Mordecai living in Persia, and Haman, a powerful royal official, hated Mordecai and wanted him dead. He hated him so much he built a massive gallows and planned to hang him. He hated him so much he arranged for all the Jews to suffer with him. 
He had the king issue a decree that on a certain day, all over the empire, Jews could be put to death. Anyone who wanted to was allowed to gather and to put them to death. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, and the way of the wicked will perish. So God used Esther to rescue his people. Mordecai wasn't hung on the gallows, and the Jews weren't put to death. Instead, the king had Haman hung on the gallows that he had intended for his enemy, and the Jews defeated their enemies. In the words of this psalm, the trouble that Haman planned recoiled on his own head. Psalm 7 in action. Or consider Jesus. Remember 1 Peter 2, verse 22, which says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. Jesus was the ultimate innocent accused, perfectly innocent in every respect, but condemned to die in shame and agony. But like the psalmist, he entrusted himself to God, to the God who judges justly, the God who watches over the way of the righteous. He gave his life in our place, and God vindicated him by his resurrection. So let me ask you again, is this psalm just rhetoric? Or can you trust God when you face injustice? Can we really believe that the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but that the way of the wicked will perish? You bet we can. You bet we can. He does. He's shown it time and time and time again. And these examples are foretastes of the vindication that we will experience in the final judgment. We may experience similar vindication now, or we may not. Either way, we may well suffer. In fact, Peter says that we're called to suffer. And that's the context of those verses from 1 Peter that I just read to you. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, he says, If you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. As Christians, we're following in Jesus' steps. And Jesus' steps lead to the cross. For Jesus, the cross meant shame and suffering. And it means shame and suffering for us too. But Jesus' shame and suffering gave way to joy and to glory. And our shame and suffering gives way to joy and to glory also. And we can know that for certain. We can have absolute confidence that it's true. We can trust it. And that knowledge is meant to sustain us in our struggles. That knowledge sustained the psalmist in his struggles. You see, if we're going to endure suffering, especially unjust suffering like this psalm, then we know, need to know that it's going to be worth it. We need to know that God is watching, that he will make it right. And that is precisely what the Bible says to us. That is what Psalm 7 says to us tonight. God is certainly there. God is certainly watching and God will certainly make it right. So can I encourage you to read and to meditate on this psalm? If you're suffering unjust accusation right now, make it your prayer and believe that it's true. And if you're enjoying plain sailing, well then get this into your head now so that when difficulties come, you'll be ready to say with the psalmist, the Lord is my shield. And like Jesus, to entrust yourself to him who judges justly. And for now, let's pray. Lord God, you are our protector. You watch over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Please grant us a sure confidence in your goodness and in your protection. And please teach us to entrust ourselves to you and to continue to do good, even as our Lord Jesus taught us by his example in dying on the cross. And for his name's sake we pray. Amen.
you is the greatest thing. 